Well, thank you so much. That was quite an introduction, and I, I truly did start when I was 12. Uh, Self-proclaimed workforce nerd, but really, really happy to be here. I think over the last day and a half, you've heard from our panelists about their workforce challenges, and I think there's some common themes, whether you're looking at it from a local standpoint, a regional standpoint, or a statewide standpoint, and then we've had panelists that have discussed education programs that are building the pipeline, and then you've also had many companies talking about their challenges and their internal solutions that they're using to upskill and find talent. Um, and personally, this is my first time at TUX, and it's really exciting to see the collaboration of both industry and other stakeholders come together. Um, and the panel today, I've actually had the pleasure of working with for several years. They're going to be discussing another innovative program that they've created for both pre-apprenticeship and apprenticeship. So it's hitting both the pipeline side of things as well as the upskilling side of things. We had a, a fun table yesterday regarding apprenticeship, a lot of fantastic questions, good discussion. And so by show of hands, how many people have been engaged in this room in either pre-apprenticeship or apprenticeship programs? Wow, so almost half of you. So your job is to educate the other half <laughs> on that. Um, and with that, I would like to bring up our first panelist. Her name is Beth Bittenbender, and she's the Executive Director of Operations for Workforce Development at Penn College of Technology. And in this role, she's been instrumental in securing almost $10 million in the last seven years in grant funding from both federal and state agencies to support apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeship expansion in the state of Pennsylvania, as well as across the US. Uh, Penn College is the registered sponsor of seven national apprenticeship programs and seven Pennsylvania apprenticeship programs, as well as, and I think this is very unique, which, which I love, they also registered two pre-apprenticeship programs for both advanced manufacturing and healthcare. And as the program sponsor, Penn College's modular industry-driven apprenticeship strategy programs have served 1,113 apprentices from over 100 employers in 26 states and 315 advanced manufacturing pre-apprenticeships from 43 schools in Pennsylvania, both charter, cyber schools, and CTEs, CTCs across the state. So with that, I would like to bring up Beth. So normally I just walk and talk, but trying to get this all in 10 minutes, I'm gonna keep some notes up here. Um, so if you do, oh, here I have the clicker. Let's see if this works. Nope, went backwards, did the same thing. Okay, so for those of you that are not familiar with Pennsylvania College of Technology, we are in Williamsport, Pennsylvania, Little League World Series, right? Everybody knows that. Um, we are also in what we affectionately call the T-Zone of Pennsylvania. So not Philadelphia, not Pittsburgh, we're the T-Zone. So there's some, we are very rural, clearly. Most of the T-Zone is very rural. We have some distinguishing characteristics. Um, lots of manufacturing, but it tends to be small to mid-sized manufacturing. Um, our population is declining, and um, we have a lot of workforce challenges as a result, of course, and rural health care is a huge concern. So we have some focus there. Um, Penn College opened in 1914 with a mission of upskilling our workforce, and that continues today. So we are a mission affiliate of Penn State with a technology um, focus and hands-on education. So typically, one hour of classroom to three hour of lab time with most of our students and most of our majors. Um, last year, our student count was 4,307, about 60% of those in four-year degree and the rest in two-year degree or credentialing. Um, that is down from the pandemic, but our, re, you know, our uptick in students is actually going crazy because of um, the programs that we offer. So, um, our two biggest majors at our school are welding and fabrication and nursing. So as you can imagine, our graduates are highly recruited, but we just don't have enough, as all of you know. Um, and so that's where my department comes in, workforce development. So we extend the mission of the college to train and upskill our largely employees of manufacturers is who we work with, the incumbent workforce largely. In healthcare, we do deal with individuals a lot, but 
Most of what we're doing is with um, manufacturers as our client, upskilling their incumbent workforce. Um, we talked about the fact that we are a sponsor of programs nationally registered, which is um, a long process. If any of you have ever done that, Pennsylvania is also long, but Danielle's here, so I'm not going to talk about that. So um, one of the benefits to our employers is that we handle all of the logistics for being a sponsor, which is really, really helpful to our employers so that they don't have to do that and they can focus on the things that they need to do, like the OJT, um, finding employees, finding apprentices, that sort of a thing. And our programs are paid for by the employer, um, which is a benefit to the employee, clearly, and by grant funding. We tend to offset funding. But um, the other thing is we do not run our apprentices through credit programs. They are in workforce programs, meaning um, we customize it for our employers. So we may go 8 in the morning till 12 in the afternoon to do an RTI session. Um, so that tends to help our employers participate more where they may not be able to. We also deliver remotely. That's how we get our numbers. Um, so in 2018, we were awarded a U.S. Department of Labor scaling apprenticeship grant. That is coming to an end here in July. And over the last five years, um, we worked with our, let me make sure I'm even on the right slide. Um, we worked with our, well, let me, let me address this first because I forgot. Um, we have about 50 people we may now have 52 people, we just hired two more people, in our department, just workforce development. So we are one of the largest workforce development departments um, probably in the country, although I don't have data to prove that. Um, last year we did serve overall 4,983 participants in a training event. So that's just in our department. So we are serving more participants than our credit program. From 674 companies, in things like clean energy, healthcare, advanced manufacturing, things like that. Um, from 44 different states, districts, and territories, um, and 26 different countries. So we have a very good sense of what workforce needs in our area of expertise. Um, I mentioned again, we, we've done a lot with apprenticeship, and MIDAS is what we um, have approached the advanced manufacturing market with making apprenticeship modular. So there's a whole lot of discussion about how that works, and if you're interested, we can talk about that. But we're going to talk more about pre-apprenticeship right now. Um, in the last five years, through that grant that I mentioned, we have served um, 96 companies with apprenticeship in 23 states and territories, and we have upskilled 1,915 people. Um, that's a lot of people in those programs that I talked about, but it's still not enough. If we, you know, quadrupled that, it still would not be enough. So, as we all know, part of the problem, and this is a small part, I shouldn't say it, it's a part, it is not the part most of you have been talking about today, which is keeping people, finding people that are currently in the workforce. But part of the problem is this pipeline from the K-12 system into industry. You've all probably said it to your schools, and you've heard from schools. Um, students don't know about manufacturing. They think it's dirty. They don't think there's good jobs in manufacturing, that sort of a thing. So schools will tell us, well, you know, what, what are we going to do? We don't have the content. We have so many other things we have to do. So our approach has been um, to develop an event, a, a pre-apprenticeship program with our supervisors our superintendent, sorry, in the local area. We got a, a Pennsylvania Department of Labor and Industry grant to develop a pre-apprenticeship program. And we thought we had the best solution ever. We went to that group, who, who were very nice and helpful, and told us um, that, that that wasn't going to work. Whatever we came up with was not going to work. Um, they're too busy. Uh, it just was not going to fit in. So we, we closed our mouths. We listened to them. And we changed things and put in place um, what we affectionately call AMP. We like a lot of, um, you know, acronyms. <laughs> Our Advanced Manufacturing Pre-Apprenticeship. So AMP is designed um, to work with primarily 10th, 11th, 12th, but mostly 11th and 12th grade students. Um, and so let's talk about some of the 
the elements? Because we, we first talked about why. So why should students be interested in pre-apprenticeship specifically? And why should schools understand what pre-apprenticeship was? So what's the benefit for them? Their parents, their family. If you don't get the parents involved, you're not going to get the kids in a lot of cases, parents and other family. Um, why should schools care? You know, why do they have to worry about it? If we don't articulate that well, then no one's going to participate. So one of the first things we came up with was this subway map of potential pathways from AMP, which is in the center, out to apprenticeship. And you may have a little a hard time reading some of those, but this is the slide we always get pictures. Everybody's got their camera up. And from the beginning, we're doing that. Because it's hard for parents and students to understand what does pre-apprenticeship lead to, apprenticeship lead to what, and what do you need to get to the next level, and what might you be paid. And by the way, it's not all about mechatronics. You know, there's management things in there. There's, we have a plastics program, so this is how you could produce um, in plastics. So, you know, we, 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 got, we went and talked to everybody. We talked to schools, we talked to parents, we talked to intermediate units, talked to everybody. So then we had to decide, OK, oh, what did I do? I hit the wrong button. So then we had to decide what? What are we going to deliver? And we chose um, the certified manufacturing associate from SME um, credential to work towards your, in your pre-apprenticeship. Um, there's a lot of reasons we did that. Um, we all understand the issues with credentialing, right? Some credentials are recognized, some are not. We wanted one that was very recognized and that would let manufacturers know that this person has a basic knowledge of the key fundamentals of manufacturing. Um, our pre-apprenticeship does not involve work. There's a big difference, and Danielle's going to talk about this some, about apprenticeship, youth apprenticeship, and pre-apprenticeship. So you do not have to be employed. It's difficult with high school students to have them employed. There's a whole logistics piece of this. So um, we do not have employment, but this credential gives a manufacturer the knowledge that they have some of that basic knowledge about manufacturing concepts, right? Um, next was who. Who are we going to go after? So again, I mentioned 10th and 12th grade, typically because you need a certain skill level to pass that credential often. Um, but we do not target CTE and CTC students. And for those of you who know what those are, you probably understand why. They're already doing it, right? They're, they're already in manufacturing. We don't, we're not going after that market. We are also not going after the kids that, I call them market, that sounded terrible, but <laughs> um, they're our, our customers, right? We are also not going after the college kids, typically, although some college track kids are in our program because they can fit it into their track. Um, but we're going for that, um, Ross knows this term, about the neglected majority, right? The one in the middle who aren't sure what they want to do. Now, the interesting thing is that um, there may only be one of those in a school that wants to do this program. And our program will allow them to do that the way we've structured it. So that's a real benefit to the schools. You don't have to have an entire classroom. You can have one, two, five. We have one school that has 33 now, I think. This, so you know, they really went all in and have a teacher and everything. Um, so where are those students? Well, yes, they're in public schools. We, if you know Pennsylvania, we have 550, 501 school districts in our state, which is a lot. That's a lot of people to talk to. But Ross has talked to probably about a third of them. Um, and most of them are in the T-zone, and they have more limited resources for their students. So this is a good program for them. Um, and increasingly, charter schools is one of our big markets because it fits in really well with their curriculum. It's, it's remote. Um, we do have, we typically deliver in the spring. So we're recruiting in the fall. We deliver in the spring. Um, and then, so yeah, charter schools is another big one. And how do we deliver? What are the other elements? Well, the related technical instruction is online. Again, I mentioned the SME content. Um, so it's flexible. You can do it in the evening if you want, um, it, like as an extra activity. You can do it in a study hall. You can have a whole class doing it at once. Um, and we give a broad overview of those industries and careers that are available in 
advanced manufacturing that they may not know, be aware of, and you know, reference back to that subway map. We also do hands-on labs. So in some cases, they will come to our campus if they are relatively close, and some come from a distance. Um, or we will send an instructor to their area if we can get a locus of students in the Allentown area or something like that. We'll send an instructor and we'll do hands-on labs with them. And our instructors are all subject matter experts that teach often apprenticeship with us. Um, so they can give the, we sometimes have a plastics instructor that will go and do some plastics labs with them. At the end of AMP, we have Industry Day. This is one of our instructors with one of our students. Um, if we can get them to come to campus, we do. We do a graduation ceremony. We also have employers, and one of them is here, to talk to them about the jobs that are available and to talk to them about um, you know, pathways that they might have. And we also allow our pre-apprenticeship students to attend our career fair, which has over 400 employers attending. Um, we do it twice a year, so they can go to our career fair if they want to and talk to employers. So the results. In 2019, which is when we started, our first cohort had two schools, and we now, in this last cohort, had 21 different schools and charter schools. And we overall, since that time, have served 43 different schools. So they can hop in and out. One year they can be in, one year out if they don't have students that are interested. That's a challenge, as you can imagine, for <laughs> Ross, who's our manager, to uh, keep up with all that. In the first year, we served 16 students. This last year we had 129 students. Um, over, I'm sorry, 129 students, yes. And we also, in the credentialing, the first year we only had four people that got that SME credential, but this last time we got 58 students to get that credential. So we went from 13% to about 15% of enrollees getting a credential. So that's a definite le um, win for us. Lessons learned. Um, I am way over. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm going fast. We, you need a Ross Berger. Ross Berger is our program manager. He's great. You can't have him, but um, he knows so many things about, uh, about K-12 education and credentialing and, and how to talk to the schools and the students, and he is the one that has made our program um, successful and uh, growing. Um, I'm not going to talk about him anymore because... I don't want you to get to know. <laughs> um, another huge lesson learned is that point of contact at the school, whether it's the guidance counselor or a tech teacher or whoever it is. That person's got to be in. They got to understand the basics. They got to be able to mentor that student through and or the parents through. Get them to come to industry day and talk to employers. There's lots and lots of things that that point of contact does that if you don't have that, um, you will have problems. Uh, alignment. Alignment is really tricky because our struggle right now is we're reaching more and more and more students, but they're not always in the same places where our employers are. Because the goal of a pre-apprenticeship is to hopefully move someone into employment, apprenticeship, and you know, uh, better paying jobs. But if we don't have employers in the same area as our students, I mentioned these, these schools are all over the state, um, how, how do you get them in jobs? Most kids aren't going to move, um, most kids in our area, I should say, aren't going to move more than 40 miles or drive more than 40 miles for a job. So this is one of the things we're struggling with, and we are having very deep conversations about how to address that. Um, one of the things that we have done is applied recently for another USDOL grant to try to bridge those, I call them the chasms, <laughs> between education and labor and apprenticeship, where uh, we may have people that went to apprenticeship, but we don't know it because the data did not transfer over from that high school record over to where we are. Um, and, and, and employers want to hire them, but there's a difficulty there. So um, I would say pulling back out and looking at this, it's really important to understand that audience, listen to them, and then design a pre-apprenticeship that will work for them, not just for you which is true in a lot of education. <laughs> I think most of you probably understand that. Um, how do we make it work for the customer, whoever that customer is? Um, and part of that is our relationship with the Department of Labor, Pennsylvania, and Danielle, 
Um, we work very, very closely with them to make sure that our programs are what they need to be to be registered and also learn from their wisdom. So I'm going to turn it over to you then. There's a reason that we're sitting in the order that we're sitting in because <laughs> I think that the collaboration that they have going, oh, I stole you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, you just heard from the education side of things and how they built their programs, why they built their programs, but without that collaboration and partnership with all the stakeholders within that community, it wouldn't be effective. And I think, Beth, you hit on that with, with what you talked about. Um, but one of those big stakeholders and, and big collaborations is with the Department of Labor here within the state of Pennsylvania. So I would like to introduce Danielle Demirovic. Uh, she started at the Apprenticeship and Training Office for the Pennsylvania Department of Labor and Industry at the end of 2021 and is thrilled to have spent the beginning of 2024 building out the pre-apprenticeship division here in the state of Pennsylvania. Danielle has an intense personal interest in apprenticeship due to her own non-traditional education and career pathway. She completed her bachelor's degree as an adult and is a certified project management professional through the Project Management Institute. She's got over 20 years of experience in the private sector, which has lent a particularly useful perspective to her role. Brainstorming with potential sponsors, other state agencies, employers, and community organizations while connecting interesting parties has been the highlight of her career. So with that, I would like to bring up Danielle. Thank you, Gretchen. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Um, I am not sure that I'm going to be able to talk to you for 10 minutes about pre-apprenticeship. <laughs> I spend all my days talking about um, about this and I'm passionate about it and uh, so I'm basically going to offer you guys a teaser right uh, and we can kind of you know I like to answer questions much more so than talking at you <clears throat> but I'm going to give you um, a few interesting facts well I think they're interesting <laughs> uh, so the apprenticeship and training office I'm required to say this by the way the Apprenticeship and Training Office uh, within the Department of Labor and Industry, Pennsylvania Department of Labor and Industry, is we handle all the policy program development and uh, compliance efforts now for registered apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeship in the state. Um, and I wanted to give you guys a couple of little facts. We have over 1,500 registered apprenticeship programs. And over half of them are in the manufacturing industry, which is uh, pretty cool. I like to think that if I would have known about manufacturing as an option when I was a young person, because I was one of the people uh, that Beth's program targets, I didn't know what I was doing. Um, it, it is nice to think that I would have had that as an opportunity. Um, and then we do have, so we have five elements of pre-apprenticeship. This is derived from federal uh, guidance, right? And the only one that I'm gonna to talk to you guys about today is the very first one. It is the most important. Um, and it's also, because it is derived from federal regulations, connection to existing apprenticeship programs, I think that that is a little watered down. What we did once, I, I was the first person to handle pre-apprenticeship in the state of Pennsylvania as its sole duty, right? Um, and when it was determined that someone was gonna be doing this, it, connection needed to be an actual thing, right? So instead of just a registered apprenticeship sponsor saying, we think that this pre-apprenticeship program should exist, it was, what are you gonna do to support them? Are you gonna have people come and speak about their organization? Are you gonna have them coach? You know, this is what it takes to interview, to get a job with us. Um, so that's a big part of what our office does when we're working with pre-apprenticeship sponsors is we encourage them. You need to push back with your registered apprenticeship sponsor. We want solid commitments because you are training the future workforce. Um, so that is uh, the primary that I'm going to focus on. I do want to throw in an aside about support services and career counseling. You guys um, have heard about Beth's program and they primarily serve uh, youth, right? Which is a common, uh, a common understanding of pre-apprenticeship is that it is to serve youth. But that's not how it is in Pennsylvania. We actually 
hope to expand. Currently, most of our programs are serving youth, but we hope to expand it because pre-apprenticeship is an ideal model to also serve underrepresented populations. Um, so these are our division priorities. I'd like to uh, show off a little bit and say that all of these are well underway in 2024. But the one that I want to talk about the most is the pre-apprenticeship program models consistent with outside agency agendas. So I've heard a lot since I've been here. I've only been here a few hours, but I've heard everyone say collaboration and how important that is. Um, that's a huge focus on this administration in, in state government, but also it's something that I am passionate about because, um, you know, we have the most manufacturing registered apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeship programs here in Pennsylvania. I want more technology. I want more health care, right? Um, and we're doing that by partnering with Pennsylvania Department of Education. Um, I do because we have... Um, the Act 158 Pathways to Graduation, the 2023 graduating class was the first to be able to use a registered pre-apprenticeship program as an alternative pathway to high school graduation. Apart from the Keystone exams, which is, you know, those rigorous exams um, that I think most states have. But um, so that's one way that we partner with PDE. Once this legislation was passed and educators were kind of scrambling to understand the different pathways, I did some trainings um, with, with the, all the educators around the state, as many as I could, basically. Um, we're also working with the adult ed side of PDE to talk about um, integrated education and training programs and aligning that with pre-apprenticeship. So that is to serve the adult population. Um, and then some of the most exciting work, in my opinion, that we're doing is uh, serving justice-impacted populations. And, I mean, I tell anyone that will listen, if you're going to create a pre-apprenticeship to serve the justice-impacted population, it should be in manufacturing. Everyone's go-to is the building trades, and I'm, I say, <laughs> they could be going anywhere, you know, a very, like, potentially two-hour radius. That's not uh, an easy sell for someone that is recently coming back from being incarcerated, right? So that's some of the exciting stuff, the exciting work that we're doing um, with collaboration, with regards to collaboration. And then this, this is just a linear graphical representation, right? So this shows the pre-apprenticeship to apprenticeship pathway. The secondary education is where almost all people start, right? Unless someone drops out in middle school. Uh, so pre-apprenticeships can be anywhere, basically, before that registered apprenticeship piece. So it can be someone in secondary education that is also, like Beth's program, getting their pre-apprenticeship during that time period. It can be after secondary education. Um, we actually, I think I said our number one priority is aligning CTE, career and technical education, with pre-apprenticeship. Um, so that is, you know, they're all slightly different, the program structures of pre-apprenticeship. It is a, a looser framework for anyone that is familiar with registered apprenticeship because there's not that employment element. So um, there's not a lot of focus on making sure that all programming is consistent, which is part of the reason that I am so passionate about it is that there are so many opportunities and ways to serve people and get them interested in your particular sector of work. Um, we are working to strengthen ties with our local workforce areas. That's actually something that hasn't come up yet in the conversations that I've heard, but that is a key focus of our office is um, further integration with our local workforce boards and the career link system, which is, I don't know what they call them nationally, one, job centers maybe, American job centers. Um, and community-based organizations, again, with trying to serve underserved populations, I think that community-based organizations are um, probably the best options for sponsoring those. Obviously, once I realized, like completely realized that pre-apprenticeship was solely dependent on registered apprenticeship, I realized that speaking engagements like this, um, talking to people and, and raising awareness about 
what exactly pre the pre-apprenticeship to apprenticeship pathway, and even just the apprenticeship pathway, what this means. Um, it's making sure that people understand what it is that you do, what we're talking about, that everyone's on the same page. Um, and that requires involvement from everyone. It's, it's all, all organization types. And I mean, I think everyone here gets that. That's why we're all here, right? <coughs> <laughs> so, so it is important to note, this is actually a staple for all my presentations. State apprenticeship agency, Pennsylvania is a state apprenticeship agency. I'm sure a lot of you, oh, any of you that are in uh, the apprenticeship game probably know what the difference between a state apprenticeship agency is and an OA state. Um, this is just a chance to reiterate that a pre-apprenticeship is meant to prepare individuals for a registered apprenticeship program. We really push that here in Pennsylvania because we can, because we are a state apprenticeship agency. Um, and then we do require classroom and hands-on learning. This has been a big, um, I don't want to say hiccup, but this is where I've seen what needs the most work and most communication with my friends in education is having them understand that the registered apprenticeship sponsor is the curriculum driver. They contact me. They say, hey, what do you think if we add this to our curriculum? And can I do this? And my first question is, does anyone know what my first question would be? Chelsea knows. <laughs> I say, yes, did you talk to your registered apprenticeship sponsor? Because they're the ones that are going to answer that, right? It's not us. And, and education here, the Department of Education, they hand out mandates. I think that's federally too, which is why they, they come to us, the state agency, but we're more of a facilitator than we are a governing body. Um, and then I did mention Act 158. And then again, at the very end here, I want to just reiterate that pre-apprenticeship, well, you said this too, Beth, pre-apprenticeship and youth apprenticeship are not the same thing. I did um, mention that I think that pre-apprenticeship is a great uh, tool to um, serve underserved populations, but it definitely goes beyond just serving youth um, because there are a lot of people out there that might not know that they want to work for your company. And someone mentioned it earlier, it's not the fish's fault, right? We have uh, 50 programs actually registered in manufacturing, again, pre-apprenticeship programs. Um, the most we have are in the manufacturing sector. And then I'm going to leave you guys with these statistics. Uh, I am not a huge fan of numbers, but a lot of people like them. Um, and then also our contact information. So if anyone is interested in discussing this outside of you know, this session and then any Q&A, please feel free to reach out to our resource account. Um, I actually really enjoy talking to other states and collaborating. So um, yeah, thank you guys so much for your time again. Thanks, Danielle. So now you've heard how the programs are put together. You've heard how labor is involved to register those programs and the requirements with that. And now we wanted you to hear from an employer from the standpoint of how are they using pre-apprenticeship and apprenticeship from a talent attraction, development, and retention strategy. So with that, um, I would like to introduce Tiffany loner Deemer as a Senior Manager of Learning and Development for West Pharmaceutical Services. She works with advanced manufacturing sites across the globe with a primary focus on improving the learning experience for team members, supporting the creation and development of standardized training programs, driving people development, and closing skills gaps across the network. She has an extensive background in workforce development, leadership training, curriculum, and program development, instructional design, and apprenticeship programs. Prior to starting with West in 2014, she had over 11 years of experience in public education teaching at the secondary and collegiate level. Her background and experiences in education and industry has allowed her to help bridge that gap between the two entities, helping our educational partners understand future industry needs. An invaluable Penn College partner, Loner Dimmer with West Pharmaceutical Services had enrolled more apprentices than any other company. So, Welcome to the stage, Tiffany, to hear about how her company is using apprenticeship as a talent development strategy. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, 
Can, is it on? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so I know we have 30 minutes to lunch, and I can see like, okay, everybody's kind of getting in that sugar slump. So I'm going to have everybody stand really fast, really fast. Everybody stand. Get you up and moving. Okay. Remain standing if you went to the game last night. Remain standing if you did not partake in too many Pepsis, like Janine said, and remember the score of the game last night. <laughs> a couple sat down. Remain standing if you're actually a diehard Baltimore Orioles fan and were really offended by the pins that the Pirates were selling. Am I the only one? Okay, all right, that's what I figured. All right, so thank you for that. I wanna make sure I go the right way here. Um, so my name is Tiffany Loner Deemer. I've been with West for over a decade now. Actually, um, it goes very quickly once you've been in industry this long. So give you a little background on West. West Pharmaceutical Services is actually a global manufacturing for medical device or container enclosure components that go on to basically a ton of drugs that you probably didn't even know that you were touched by a West product, okay? So if you potentially had any sort of therapy or vaccines or treatments during the COVID-19 pandemic, West literally had their hands right into helping deliver the vaccines and the therapies that were needed during that pandemic. We partnered directly with the pharmaceutical companies to make sure that they have a, a container and com a component closure system so that they can get the drugs out to the people that they need. And that's what West does. So we have a very, very critical mission in healthcare. So we also have a very critical mission to make sure that we have the team members that we need who are highly skilled, who understand the purpose, the vision, the mission, the values of the company, as well as understand the need for high quality products so that we do not negatively impact the supply chain of the medical um, pharmaceutical companies. So we started talking about this probably in like 2017, 2018. And one of our VPs of HR at that time reached out because we were seeing shortages starting to happen as early as 2017, 2018 in very critical technical skills roles. We started to then think about, well, why apprenticeships? And even now, as I've, been ta I've taken over the apprenticeship program for West in 2022, I started to do a lot of research over the past year. So, some of the ones, and these are statistics very similar to what I think Janine had up there, but these are some of the research from different articles. More than half of our team members in a recent survey in 2022 felt that career development or career advancement was an area of need, okay? Another statistics from research says that high paid jobs requiring shorter and less expensive training are going unfilled. And that poses a huge threat to the economy. And I know that we all felt that pinch of social um, or the supply chain need during the COVID time. I have a feeling that's not going to end anytime soon. In manufacturing, this is the one that's the most alarming and I share this out with everybody possible. This was from 2021. In manufacturing, 50% of operations related team members are set to retire in the next seven to nine years. We're already behind this. So we're already thinking, okay, that's actually only about four or five years away. So those are some scary statistics and that's why we started to think, why do we need to invest in apprenticeship programs? Why do we need to invest in our team members? We needed to really attract those high quality team members. We needed to have programs that could kind of attract those team members into our company and build that brand. We also needed to make sure that people were learning the skills for the current job roles but also for future job roles. We have, just like Matt said yesterday, we have the, the alphas all the way up through the baby boomers. In fact, we're even calling baby boomers out of retirement to come back and work for us at times. So by doing that, we know that eventually they're going to retire and we need to transfer those skills to those younger generations. We also had identified specific needs. We realized that we had a, a critical need for PLC programming, robotics, and automation in order to drive the company forward. It's also a changing workforce, and so with that, 
we knew that we also needed to change some of our leadership strategies as well. And so we needed to connect what I call the pipes, which is kind of what Beth was talking about. So looking at some of those things, we needed to start to connect how do we attract the right team members, upskill and reskill our team members in order to do this. And that's really where Penn College of Technology came into play. And yes, West is a global site. We have over 50, min, or we have over 50 West sites, but we're also in that T right in central Pennsylvania. The, uh, we have several facilities that sit right there. When Penn College approached us and we approached them, they were also able to scale apprenticeship programs for us because we have, just in the United States, 11 sites that we needed to think about across the country. Forming that partnership was vital for us. And so I'm not gonna go through all the little nitty gritties here of this partnership, but the partnership that we have with Penn College of Technology actually spans back to the 80s. And it spans back to the 80s because West went to the Penn College of Technology and said, we need a plastics program because at that time we were really driving plastics. We needed molding programs. And so Penn College was really that partner to really start that curriculum process. West partners with them, we've created endowment scholarships. Um, when the college was awarded a huge federal grant, uh, we were able to capitalize on that and then start seven apprenticeship programs across nine locations within the United States. Those apprenticeships are still going, and in fact, when we told them that we had a specific need for robotics and automation, Penn College worked with us, and our company, along with the college, actually developed a two-year robotics and automation apprenticeship program that's now re registered through the national um, or, uh, DOL. So creating that global apprenticeship program with a U.S. focus, okay? So this was just a U.S. program to start these apprenticeship programs. These are some of our locations. Uh, you can see we have Jersey Shore, Pennsylvania, Williamsport, Pennsylvania, which is where I'm from, Upper Darby, which is our tool shop. Then we have sites in North Carolina, Florida, Nebraska, Arizona, Michigan. So all of these sites were all experiencing similar needs and similar business needs. So we developed a structure. So we had a corporate lead. We had corporate sponsors. We also then had the college partners who partner very regularly with us. I meet with Beth and her team. I also meet with, they also meet with my learning and development team on a monthly cadence, and in some cases, a bi-weekly cadence. So it truly is that partnership. We've also identified what the local site needs, what my role is, what the corporate sponsor's role are, so that we could make sure that we were able to continue this program for, sustain for sustainability. We also then had to think through, it's not just about establishing the external structure, but it's also how do we support this internally? And so we had to think through what are the roles and responsibilities of the different entities within our organization, along with the apprentice, along with the mentor, and along with the college. And we worked through that as a team. And I meet with the team monthly. We have an apprenticeship council across all the sites, and we meet very regularly to go over this. We also then thought, okay, we've, you can't just have an apprentice. You have to have the journey workers. You have to have the mentors. That's very critical. That's the secret sauce, as one of the team members from Penn College likes to say. It's the mentoring. And we realized we needed to upskill the mentors as well and kind of retrain them on how to be a good mentor. So we thought, how can we provide some mentoring at sites? And we created an e-learning, and we created councils to work with the mentors. We also then created a program so that we could make sure we were getting the right people into the right programs. I'm sure, just raise of hands, how many people have ever come to you in your organization and say, well, I want to grow, I want to develop, I want to do this, I want to do that. But then when you start talking to them, you got to kind of figure out what it is that they want to do. And so we created this exploratory, um, basically, team member development interview guide to help guide them and make sure we were putting them into the right program. We have apprenticeship review councils at sites, which actually works very well. It really gets the buy-in of the people at each location as well. And then we also then started to think, how can we embed these apprenticeship programs and the team members going through these programs into an individual development plan? So it's documented. From there, here's some statistics. I will tell you this, this is a journey. Our first apprenticeship programs really started 
in about 2019, and it's been a journey. I mean, we're five years later. And these are some of our statistics, though, from our company. We've had more than a 25% retention rate improvement for these people going through our programs, registered in an apprenticeship program versus team members who are not. That's a huge retention rate improvement for anybody who's lost a lot of people, especially during pandemic times. More than 90% of team members who complete a program are still with West. So I know a lot of people get leery, oh, do we wanna pay, do we wanna invest in them? They might leave, what happens if they leave? The statistics actually show if you train them, they will stay. There's an improved internal promotion rate. Nearly 40% of those who completed the program were internally promoted then into a different job. That's a cost avoidance. That's a cost savings to you as a company because you're now not having to go out there and then do all the recruiting and do all the hiring or have vacant positions. You're able to internally promote. And finally, one of our big critical areas is maintenance. And we know that maintenance is critical for a lot of us because when those equipments go down, those presses, those processes go down, that can kind of have a rippling effect on your, your downtime, your yields, your scrap, everything else. So we were actually able to reduce the number of days that maintenance positions remained open in 2022 and 2023 by training these apprentices through a mechatronics program or an industrial manufacturing technician program and then being able to internally promote those maintenance techs. So this is all great and fantastic, but what's next? Like I said, the conversation started in 2017, 2018, and at that time, we were starting to venture out into the high schools different programs throughout the community to start to kind of get that, get the labor in. But then COVID happened and then we couldn't do anything. We were very, we kind of had our hands tied quite a bit. So we're starting to think through how do we connect more pipes? We have high school CTE programs and related curricular programs. We have workforce development centers in our communities. We have second chance employees, which I think was phenomenal to hear from the gentleman yesterday who are looking for that, that chance or that second career. And we have immigrants. We have, we've actually have a couple of Ukrainian immigrants in our area. They're all looking for jobs and they're looking for work. And so how do we tap into that talent and upskill and reskill these people? And that's where we need to work closely with the college and share these ideas. We have to set up programs and we actually have um, Heather's with me today. Uh, she also worked at West, but she also worked for 20 some years at Penn College. She is our campus and community ambassador. Her entire role is to work with the talent acquisition team to also go out there and get our name and brand out there and connect those dots with these types of programs. And then we have co-ops, internships, and pre-apprenticeships. And that's really, those pre-apprenticeships are what are going to help us connect those pipes together. And we're now actively engaged in how do we get the pre-apprenticeship programs embedded into West into a registered apprenticeship program. That's it. Thank you very much. I'll hand it back over to you. Thank you so much. I think that was fantastic information. I think you can see how the continuum works from developing the programs registering the programs and how it really impacts employers. I was incredibly impressed, Tiffany, with the statistics that you had. I think a lot of you in the room, I saw you writing things down and, and taking a look at that, but I think that just shows the power of how these programs can really impact some of the workforce challenges that we're seeing. Um, and now I'd like to, do we have time for questions? Yes, we do. Love to open it up for questions. If anybody has a question, right up here in front. So I've got a question for both uh, Danielle and Tiffany. You'll probably answer together. Uh, how are you combating uh, the increase in technology advances at the facility with the level of education that you're able to provide at the school? How, how are you ensuring that the schoolhouse is, is progressing the technology in the same pace and frequency as the, the industry you're providing to? <laughs> Are we talking about K-12 or are we talking about Penn College? For Penn College. Um, 
that is an ongoing challenge. Uh, we, we have labs that are probably the best in, in the state, and we are constantly getting um, donations. We have a corporate engagement that, I don't know the figures, I think it's over 30 million they brought in in donations and to just get new equipment, do, we're building a clean energy building on campus, uh, uh, you know, all those things cost a lot of money and it's accelerating fast. As soon as you get the funding, it has now cost 25% more to do what you're trying to do. So it is a huge challenge. Um, we, do, we do grant funding, we get people to donate equipment. Um, our staff is often the ones fixing equipment across campus, especially in our plastics department because it's a very specialized kind of a thing. Um, so it's a challenge, it's a big challenge, but we are really exploring AR, VR, right now um, in a variety of what we hope and digital twin we're involved with a digital twin initiative with Penn State so um, there's a lot of potential there but that's a bridge it's not a substitute for the actual work right but if you can bridge somebody from no knowledge to some AR VR digital twin kind of thing and then get them actually hands-on um, that could accelerate things does that answer your question I can also speak to, you know, on the state side, it's, we are, there's, we have about $12 million coming out of our office in the next few months um, to, <clears throat> excuse me, support the efforts of all the apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeship sponsors. I mean, we have, I think, $3 million coming out just to support CTE and pre-apprenticeship alignment in, in a couple weeks, I think. So that is one way that we, our office, can help to uh, mitigate some of those costs. And, and from an industry standpoint, it's the communication. Honestly, it comes down to making sure that you have frequent communication with not just the college level, but also the high school programs and CTE. So we have members of our organization who regularly sit on occupational advisory committees. Uh, like I said, Beth and I meet very regularly. Um, we have other L&D specialists throughout the network who are also in constant communication with the instructors and, the, and the, the program managers there at Penn College. So that's a huge win for us because we can say, hey, these are the types of robots that we're seeing. These are the types of programs that we need um, so that the college can work with us too. If I could, I'm going to insert myself at the empty chair the end of the panel, and because I wanted to add something, because we just heard that it's such an important question what this gentleman just asked, right? It's kind of, he, he puts it on your lap, and he's saying, okay, state of Pennsylvania, and okay, education system, and employers, how are you helping the schools and the education pipeline keep pace with all of this fast-evolving technology? And you all did a great job kind of talking about from your chair what you can do to acknowledge and influence and impact those changes, right? Keep pace. What, part of the answer also should be what is it that our federal agencies mm -hmm. and what is it that those Manufacturing USA institutes and their partners with like SME where when you heard from the smart manufacturing comments this morning, they are standing up what are called smart manufacturing innovation centers in the case of smart manufacturing. One of them resides at Penn State, Beth, I think you mentioned Penn State at their Kensington Foundry, which by the way has a booth down the hall. If you want to see an example of how Penn State is collaborating with SESME and SME and others to bring those technologies forward and with them are many of the same resources that you've been hearing our panelists talk about whether it be some of those certifications that are aligned with industry, whether it's some of the learning that's aligned with industry, and all of the ways that together we can sort of reduce that churn and improve that efficacy as we move people across all of that, all of that funnel and all of that pipeline. So I just, I, I wanted to give the perspective from, from the technology side and just uh, to all the good work that you're doing. So thank you for the question. It's a very important one. And I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions, if anyone has oh, up front. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you for the panel. It's an excellent species and presentations of what you exposed to us. Uh, my, my key question I asked, wanted to ask is in panel, is how far has the industry gone uh, to acquire apprenticeship programs into their 
uh, curriculums at the colleges also. How uh, long is, would you say it would take to establish an apprenticeship program between industry, Department of Labor, and the college? So I can, I'll take that one to start. So like I said, we started the conversation back in 2017. And as an organization at that time, um, we decided to pilot two people going through an apprenticeship program. Um, one of those apprentices is kind of like the golden child of Penn College because he's just amazing as an employee, as a, as, as a person, um, but it took, it took years. I'm not going to lie. It, it's a journey. It's not something that you can just kind of find a puzzle, put it together, and throw it out there. It, it takes a long time to kind of build those apprenticeships and get it right, and there were lessons learned along the way. Um, for example, there for a while I felt like we were just kind of throwing numbers, like it was a numbers game. Let's just get as many apprentices into a program as we can. But we weren't getting the right people into the right programs, and that was a, a lesson learned that we had to kind of take a step back. Some of the other lessons learned were building those mentors. You have to think about that before you just kind of dive into an apprenticeship program. Who are your mentors? Who are your journey workers? What happens when your mentors don't know or don't have the skills, even though they might be in the industry for 30 years, how are you going to handle it when they don't have the skills and the apprentices are learning more than they are? Mm -hmm. So those are conversations that you really have to think through and you have to kind of build the program and the structure and it, it takes a long time, I'm not gonna lie. So Kiers. And I would say, so our first program was Mechatronics and CNC was quickly after that. We already had experts in that field. They were working on it. They put it together. We got industry input and, and finalized it. And then each program we've added has been because industry has asked us to do it. There are many industries who ask us to do programs and we don't do it because often we don't have the subject matter expert to teach it or to create it. Um, or they don't have enough people to put it. If you're only going to train two people, that's a big investment. And you know, so. So we have to be very strategic about what we choose to do um, and deliver. And, and we're upgrading our curriculum every year as we learn, you know, as something comes better. Now we're looking at how to integrate AR, uh, VR, AI, AR VR, sorry, um, into different components. How can it maybe um, help some of our uh, RTI lab kind of time? Um, so. So it depends on the program. We have one-year programs, we have four-year programs. We don't have anything longer than four years. And that, to ask a person and a company to commit to a four-year program is a lot, but we try to get them through as effectively as possible. Um, the interesting thing with the mentor, um, that is really challenging because your apprentices are taking a lot of time, it's 144 hours a year, right? That they have to be an RTI. And then they have to do their, their on the job. So to ask your mentor to also be in a training you know, now you're taking even more time out of their schedule. So that's been a challenge. Um, but this is that first generation. Everyone who graduates, now we're talking about, okay, how do we teach the apprentices to be the mentor? You may not have been mentored terribly well in certain ways, so how can you be better at that? Um, and we're developing, that's more online, that trying to teach them some different things, and, and West is using a lot of that. But a lot of program, a lot of companies don't have that. We work with some very small employers. so. We have to try to figure out, okay, what resources can we bring to that? We, we, we thought we could just do this and be, be really good at that. And then we found out, oh shoot, well we gotta do this too, and we gotta do this, and we gotta do this, and this. And so, um, so finding partners that are good at it and, and trying to leverage what you already have and what other people have done is very helpful because we can't do everything. Use the group model. <clears throat> Use <laughs> <laughs> registering is a whole other yeah, thing. Yeah, <laughs> registering your program. I mean, if there are people that are interested in registering a program, that's great. I would never dissuade anyone from doing it. But there are groups out there that exist, especially in manufacturing. I've told you guys numbers of times. <laughs> it's that's the biggest amount of programs in our state. There are group models out there. You heard from Catalyst Connection. You guys are a group model, right? Mm -hmm. So. And you know the structure is, it, it, it's pretty flexible in that you can have a, an industry association sponsoring a program, or you can have a college do it. So, 
So uh, before you just decide I want a program, it's important to take a step back and consider what the possible structure could look like and who you can partner with. Big answer. <laughs> I, I think we're a little bit out of time, but I, I did want to say one thing before Dan comes on. One of the things that I think is really interesting, and I hope all of you in the audience are learning, we've had a lot of different programs come up and talk about their pipeline programs, whether it was the Uniquely Abled Academies, New Century Careers, and, and the program that you just heard about. These might be in specific geographic regions currently, but they're all scalable and replicable with the same success. So I hope you take some of these lessons that you've heard, reach out to some of the panelists, um, to see is this something that can be recreated in your area to help solve some of those those challenges that you're experiencing.